All right, good afternoon. I'm here to do your Tuesday lecture and just hope you're staying safe in Corona Gatton. I have all my toilet paper here, so I am good to go. All right, 19th century Asia is what we're talking about. Specifically, it's going to be China and Japan. However, before I do that, I want to show you what Blackboard looks like right now. There have been a couple of changes in here. Uh, first thing I want you to see is where it says syllabus. So when I click on syllabus, it's going to open up that syllabus page. First thing you might notice, it says virtual office hours. If you click this link, it's going to take you to a program called Discord. Uh, some of you may already use it. Some of you may have never heard of it. Uh, Discord can be run on your phone. It can be run on your computer. It can be run through a web browser. But when you click this link, it will take you to this page right here. This is kind of just virtual office for me where we can talk, we can chat, uh, I can give you information, you can ask me questions. Uh, there's also a voice channel so that we can talk if you ever need to. Uh, I am logged in on both my computer and my phone so you can just send me a message or whatever you may need and I can get to you pretty quickly. Also, our course schedule has changed just a little bit. You'll notice that instead of specific dates, it now says week of 323, uh, week of 330. And I've got it broken down Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now I have to make a couple of quizzes for you guys. So there will be a quiz posted about the 19th century Asia questions or the readings, the 19th century Europe readings, so on and so on. So you will still have to read some of these things. We just won't get a chance to talk about them in person. Uh, you do still have to read mouse. Uh, you still have to do reflection papers, SLO, SA, everything else. Now where it says the SLO, SA right here, that should actually say the SLO, SA rough draft. So I will change that as soon as I'm done with this here. Okay, underneath lessons, The reflection paper drop boxes, the due dates have been changed to reflect those new Sunday deadlines. The museum review drop box has also changed. I'm going to click on that real quick and show you what's different. You're going to see now an approved list of virtual museums and an approved list of historical films. Since most museums are closed right now, uh, it's not fair to make you go to a museum. You just stand outside the door, which you don't get to see much. So I went through and found some museums where you can do online viewing of exhibits and then you'll write your review on that or if you would rather do a historical film i've got a list of films here you can use the links i provided just go to the movie trailer that way you can get an idea what the movie is about before you spend two plus hours watching it uh, you'll have to rent the movie borrow the movie whatever you may do from uh, the source of your choice. There are many, many out there, but these are all very good movies. I think you will like them. The other thing I'm going to show you under lessons, you may notice the SLO Dropbox. There is now a place for you to upload your rough draft. That rough draft is still due on Sunday, 329. When you upload your rough draft, I'll spend some time reading them. I'll give you some feedback and then that will help you write your final edition. And then the last thing to show you under lessons, I am going to start making folders of each topic. Here you see the 19th century Asia. This is where the PowerPoint I made will live. A link to this video will also live here and I will put your quiz in here as well. All quizzes will be due on Sunday night. So if you watch this and you say, I don't see a quiz yet, that's because I have not yet posted it. Um, all quizzes, you'll get a notice that the quiz is available and then it will be completed. You'll have to answer it by Sunday night at midnight. Okay, let's go back to this right here. Let me click on present. And let's talk about 19th century Asia and what's going on there. 
Now you might ask why India is not included. It's only China and Japan. That's because India is more of the imperialism thing, mainly because of Britain and the British Empire. So you'll learn about India in a couple of days. All right, China is first. When we get to the 1800s, China is entering a crisis. On the outside, China looks very good. It looks like a strong civilization, but in reality, things are starting to fall apart in China. Uh, the big reason for that is just the population increase. There is between 1750 and 1850, just in that 100 years, a population increase of almost 200 million people. 1750, the population is about 180 million. When we get to 1850, that population is 430 million. Uh, this is a very, very big deal because it causes famines. There's not enough food for everybody. Uh, the Chinese peasants, they lose their land and they increase in their poverty. Uh, people are forced to sell their land for way below value just so that they can afford food and so that they can live every day. Because things are getting so much more difficult for the lower class, revolutionary groups start to form. We also have the entrance into China of Britain, and they're going to do this through the opium trade. Now, opium, that's where you get heroin and things like that. So yes, Britain is going to become basically a drug dealer. Now the British are importing large amount of tea, large amounts of porcelain, large amounts of silk from China. The British are trying to sell things to the Chinese, but the Chinese don't want anything. So the British have to find something that the Chinese will buy, and they do that by smuggling in opium, giving it to the Chinese, and then getting the Chinese hooked on the drug. Now the government is going to declare opium illegal because they realize how bad this addiction gets and they see how much money the British are making off of China because of this. Britain requires the opium to be bought in silver. So all of the silver that Britain is giving China for buying the tea, the porcelain, and the silk, they're basically stealing by getting it back through the drug trade. Now, the story of what happens is actually kind of dirty here. Um, the British agree to surrender all of the opium to the Chinese government. And the British, they take all of the opium, put it on British Navy ships, and then tell the Chinese officials to come get it. When the Chinese board the British Navy ships, Britain says it's an act of war and Britain declares war on China. So just to get this straight, China makes this drug illegal. Britain agrees to stop selling the drug, tells the Chinese to come get the drugs from their ships, and when the Chinese board the ships, the British say that this is an act of war. It's pretty dirty. Now, the war is going to go from September 4th, 1839 until August 9th, 1842. The Chinese do not do very well. They lose everywhere. The end result of this war is something called the Treaty of Nanking. It is a very one-sided treaty. Britain gets everything they want. The first thing that happens is this system called the Canton System is abolished. If you remember when we talked about China and Japan earlier, they tried to exclude and kick out all of the Europeans. In China, the only place the Europeans could trade was in Canton. Well, this Treaty of Nanking rips up that isolation, and now the cities of Canton, Amoy, Fuchao, Ningpo, and Shanghai can all be accessed by Britain. And the British, they bring their ships, they bring traders, they bring families, they bring missionaries. All of that's going to happen. The Chinese are even forced to pay $21 million for all the opium that was destroyed in the war, even though the Chinese made opium illegal in the first place. And then last but not least, China is forced to give Hong Kong to Britain. 
and Britain is going to hold on to Hong Kong all the way from 1842 until 1997. After the Opium War ends, we get this idea called the Spheres of Influence. Basically, all of the different European countries are going to carve up part of China. They don't make it a colony, but they say, this is mine, nobody else can do business here. Now that happens because there's a second Opium War. Uh, Britain wants to get more from China, and they go to France and say, hey, will you help me get it? So in 1856, Britain and France, they declare war on China. China loses again. France gets its own treaty, just like Britain has. And China is forced to sign a treaty that says whatever one country gets, another country gets as well. So if France gets a puppy, Britain gets a puppy. If Britain gets a puppy, Germany gets a puppy. And China is just cracked open like a nut. Russia ends up getting the part called Manchuria. Japan gets access to Korea. Britain gets the Yangtze River, Shanghai, and Tibet. France gets all of southern China, and Germany gets the area around Beijing in the Tsingtao uh, Peninsula. Now, once again, that doesn't mean that China is turned into a colony. These are parts of China where only those countries can do business. Christian missionaries are allowed to operate within China, and the Chinese government is actually forced to pay for the cost of all these wars. Now, I said this leads to a couple of rebellions. The first rebellion is called the Taiping Rebellion. The Taiping are also known as the Taiping Tian Kuo, or the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace. It's founded in the year 1850. Now, the guy who creates it, his name is Hung Xiu Xuan. Not going to test you on that, but that's what his name is, Hung Xiu Xuan. Uh, he is the founder of the Taiping. Uh, he says that he was approached in a dream and told that his job was to destroy the Manchu dynasty, overthrow the emperor, and he gathers followers. His followers, they cut off their pigtails, which was the traditional hairstyle. They demand an end to private ownership. They want equal rights for women. They want to outlaw foot binding. And then they want to make the use of liquor, opium, and tobacco punishable by death. Now, the Taiping Rebellion, it does not really do well. Another part of it, they want to outlaw the idea of ancestor worship. So they, Taiping, they actually kind of make everybody angry. The peasants don't like them because of getting rid of the traditional ways of life. Merchants don't like them because they're afraid of losing their liquor sales and their tobacco sales. The rich don't like them because they are afraid of being divorced of their wealth, I'll say. And then nobody liked them because of the equal rights for women. In the end, this is going to last for 14 years. There are over 20 million Chinese who die, and they never get foreign support, they never get local support, and it fails. However, the government realizes maybe we need to change. And so the government does try to reform. And the reforms are gonna be a mix of traditional Chinese culture and some Western style ideas. All of these reforms are going to lead up to something called the 100 Days Reform. It happens in 1898. And you can see there the list of things that the government decides to do. They're going to create a parliament. They're going to adopt a constitution. They're going to reorganize the civil service and make it more modern. They're going to promote their industry. They're going to create modern schools, create a modern university. And they're going to create mate, the dead so that they can save the land. Guess what? All of these reforms fail. Now, the reason they fail is because the emperor, his name is Kuang Su, he agrees to everything. And he puts these reforms into place starting on June 11th of 1898. Well, his aunt overthrows him. And on September 21st, the emperor is overthrown by his aunt, 
the emperor undoes everything. Or the ant's emperor. His ant undoes everything that he tried to do, and the reforms all fail. We have another rebellion. It's called the Boxer Rebellion. These guys are actually known as the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Uh, they're better known as the Boxers. This is a group that forms in the mid-1880s. They're anti-Western, they're anti-Christian, and they're very violent. In the year 1900, there is a rebellion that breaks out. The boxers, they sweep into the capital city of Beijing. They kill 242 foreign officials. They kill thousands of Chinese who worked with the Westerners. And then they burn hundreds of buildings, including the Forbidden Palace. There's a multinational army of 20,000 soldiers that have to invade China to stop this rebellion. Uh, there are soldiers from France, soldiers from Britain, soldiers from Germany, Russia, Japan, and the United States all invade China to stop this rebellion. And as you can guess, the rebellion fails. There are some results, though. There's a guy named Sun Yat Sen who gathers another group of revolutionaries. And Sun is a little bit different than the other guys. He's not about violence. He wants a peaceful solution. The big things that Sun Yat-sen believes in, uh, first one is nationalism. He wants to overthrow all the dynasties and create the idea of a republic that works for all of the Chinese. Uh, he believes in democracy. Now, the Chinese really have no idea what democracy is, but Sun Yat-sen thinks that the Chinese people can understand it and learn it. And then there's this idea called agrarianism. Sun Yat-sen wanted to redistribute land to the peasants. He thought that there were too many wealthy, too many people that owned wealth, and he wanted to divide up the land, give it back to the peasants so that peasants could make a living. Now, Sun Yat-sen and his ideas are supported by the Japanese. The Japanese start giving Sun Yat-sen's group money supported by Chinese working in the United States and supported by Chinese working in Hawaii. Both Chinese working in Hawaii and the U.S. start sending money back to China as well. Now Sun Yat-sen's movement, it comes to fruition. On October 10th, 1911, the Nationalist Revolution occurs and Sun Yat-sen and his democratic ideas win. The Manchu dynasty is overthrown, and that ends over 4,000 years of rule by emperors in China. Now for Japan. Now just a real quick reminder, Japan had been isolated for years, going all the way back to those exclusion acts we talked about a couple weeks ago. The Tokugawa shogunate, they expelled all the Europeans. They kept everything the same. They still traded with the Dutch in the city of Nagasaki. The Portuguese, remember, expressly abidden any Christian missionaries were killed on site. The economy of Japan, the people of Japan, life hadn't changed for about 200 years. On the left, you see a picture of traditional samurai. In the middle, you see a traditional taiko drum. And then on the right, you see traditional kabuki theater. These were things that the, China, or the Japanese hadn't changed in over 200 years. Time stood still in Japan. Well, the opening of Japan happens beginning in 1853. The United States president, a guy named Millard Fillmore, orders the Navy to go to Japan. And the person put in charge of the mission, his name is Commodore Matthew Perry. Uh, Matthew Perry, he sails into Tokyo Harbor on July 8th, 1853. The reason he's going is to basically open up a gas station. The United States Navy was becoming a global Navy and the US Navy needed places to stop, refuel the ships, get off the boat and let the, the sailors 
have a little bit of shore leave. So Commodore Matthew Perry brings a letter from Millard Fillmore. It's a message of goodwill, it's a message of friendship, and it's a request, can we use your island as a place to stop and get gas? The Shogun is given one year to come up with his decision. Matthew Perry comes back in 1854 and the Treaty of Kanagawa is signed. And this is a very, very one-sided treaty. U.S. citizens are going to be protected by the U.S. military and U.S. law. Japanese law does not apply to U.S. citizens. There's a tariff passed that makes it really easy for the U.S. to sell stuff to Japan, but Japan could not sell anything to the United States. And within two years of the passing of that treaty, there are 15 other nations that had a treaty that was exactly the same. Now this opening of Japan, it creates a real debate on what to do within Japan. There are some that want to stay traditional. They want to close Japan back down. There are others that want to change and go full-blown Western style, forget traditional culture. And then there's a third group that says, maybe we can blend the two. Maybe traditional culture and Western style beliefs can mix. And that's going to be the group that wins. The Meiji Restoration is going to be the result of this. In 1866, two of the Japanese clans, the Chozu and the Satsuma clans, they're both located in southern Japan. They say, okay, let's overthrow the Shogun. Let's restore the emperor to political power. That's the only way we can change. Those two clans make good on their promise, and in 1867, they take over the imperial court, they kick out the shogun, they rename the city of Edo to the city of Tokyo, make it the political location of the emperor, and then they give power to the 15-year-old emperor. Now, his original name was Mutsuhito, but when he became the emperor, he becomes known as Emperor Meiji. And his reign goes from 1869 to 1912, and that becomes known as the Meiji Restoration. Now, Meiji didn't actually have control. Most of the power went to the members of those two clans, the Chozu and the Satsuma. Uh, he does get something passed called the Charter Oath. The Charter Oath gets rid of class lines. It lets commoners into middle-class occupations. It gets rid of feudalism and it gets rid of outlaw, it outlaw samurais. Uh, when they get rid of samurais, Japan brings in a Western style military. Even more than that, Japan sends people to Europe and the United States to learn as much as they can about Western civilization. Uh, they study industry, they study politics, they study education, and then Japan is going to import Western advisors to help Japan write new laws update their economy and update their schools. Japan is going to go from a feudal society to a modern society in less than 20 years. Japan stood still for 200 years and then they suddenly welcome in Western ideas and it takes about 20 years for Japan to become a modern country. Nowhere in the world has industrialization happened as fast as it did in Japan. Japan gets a constitution. In 1889, the emperor comes up with a constitution. After studying European governments, they decide that the Prussian or German model of government is the one they want. The emperor will stay the head of state. The emperor has the highest source of power, and the emperor has advisors that help the emperor decide what to do. A parliament called the Diet is created. The Diet is going to help the Emperor make laws. The Diet has two classes of members. There's an upper house of nobles and a lower house of elected officials. Voting rights are given to men who are at least 25 years old. There are some civil rights like freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, but there's a little asterisk and the Constitution says those rights can be suspended for any reason. 
Now, because Japan ends up with a constitution, a lot of European countries now view Japan as an equal, and Japan is treated like a Western country after 1889. Now, something very important in Jap Japanese history is Japanese imperialism. By 1890, Japan has over 50 million people. Japan is out of space. They need to import everything. Japan can't grow enough food. It can't get enough supplies. It doesn't have enough raw materials. So Japan looks at all the other countries and say, you know what? European countries are taking over places. We should do the same thing. So Japan decides the best way they can grow is to steal foreign territory and then steal the food and raw material from those places. In other words, Japan says, hey, everybody else is doing it, so why can't we? Now, the first movement in Japanese imperialism is the Sino-Japanese War. That happens in 1894. It's between the Chinese and the Japanese. The Japanese win. They gain control of the island of Taiwan. They gain control of parts of Manchuria, and Korea becomes a colony of Japan. Korea will stay a colony of Japan until after World War II ends. Then in 1904, we get the Russo-Japanese War. That's between Japan and Russia. Uh, they're both fighting over the same part of China. Russia wants a warm water port, meaning a place where shipping can happen all year round and they get that when they take a place in china called port arthur japan wants control of the manchurian railroad which crosses through the same territory that russia wanted so a war starts japan is going to attack russia without warning on february 8 1904 the japanese destroy the russian navy at the city of port arthur the Tsar of Russia is angry about that, of course. He sends the European fleet all the way around the world to go and fight Japan, and the European-Russian Navy is defeated as well. Japan is going to destroy all but two Russian ships. The Japanese are going to take thousands of prisoners. And they are going to kill something like 12,000 sailors from the Russian Navy. What does Japan lose? 117 men in three boats. That's all. Now, Japanese imperialism is going to continue from there and it is going to eventually lead up to World War II. All right, so that's what's going on in China and Japan in the late 1800s, early 1900s. We'll talk more about both when we talk about World War II. All right, that's it for now. Uh, we will be back with a new lesson on Thursday. We'll see you later.